Yeah, they're they're at the um, oh, what do we call that? The uh, um, eight eight o'clock service. Oh yes, 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 yes. Right, right. So be- they're not going to stop in. Where did are we? Okay, l- let me. You know what? While we're waiting for them, let me just do a little bit of review for you. That would be really nice. Thank you. Okay. Um, and maybe that'll help you if you slept through parts of last week. Um, <laughs> okay. So Kings 2 is David dies. And then he um, he tells, um, tells Solomon, he makes a charge to Solomon. And... Um, and the first part of his charge is very much like Deuteronomy. Okay, be strong, you know, keep the charge of the Lord your God, walk in his ways, his commandments, establish his word. Then God will establish his word and, you know, everything will be hunky dory. Okay, which is just like it is down here in Deuteronomy 30. Uh, walk in his ways, then you shall live and become numerous. Okay. However, What's after that? Now, now this Deuteronomy thing um, goes through this whole idea that um, uh, if people follow God's commandments, things will turn out correct or right or good. Okay. Whereas if they don't, then things will go to hell in a handbasket. Yeah. And uh, that's kind of the whole tenor of uh kings and it kings shows why there was eventually an exile and why god quote abandoned them unquote okay but it's all mixed in with this other stuff which um you have to think huh um because it it it, like it veers back and forth between this this you know if if you keep God's statutes, things will be great. uh, And if you don't, things will be bad. Okay. With just the the political machinations and whatnot of what's going on in the actual world. So the first part of this is is like the uh the charge. And then he goes on to say things like, Moreover, you know also what Joab did to me. And, all, and how he killed two commanders of the armies of Israel. And so I want you to uh, make sure that uh, he dies badly, basically. Do not let his gray head go down to Sheol in peace. Okay. And one of the things that Abner did was, um, was he was part of the killing of Absalom, David's... Um, uh, uh, cherished son who led the rebellion against David. And then here um, is where Abner, uh, this is one of the reasons why he's, he, David wants Solomon to, to kill Joab and he kills Joe. He kills this guy, Abner. Um, Okay, as a way to, because Abner killed his brother, and so he can also eliminate a rival. He also kills a guy named Amasa, who was also uh, a head of the army, and he basically struck, you know, uh, takes out a rival for his role as commander of, of an army. And then we get down here, where this guy named Shema, or this guy named, um, this is not Shema, um, this guy named Barz- Barzillai um, helped out uh, David when he was um, leaving Jerusalem because of Absalom's revolution. And um, so he wants Solomon to deal great deal loyally with, with him. And then there's this guy, Shammai, who basically... Um, um, <clears throat> swore at him and cursed him when he was leaving Jerusalem because of his son Absalom. So um, make sure that uh, he, you know, he, he, he doesn't go down to, um, 
chill without blood on his head. Um, and so David died. And then here's, um, this is where they think maybe the tomb of David is right here along this wall. Are we and this is what it looks screen? like. What? Are we looking at a different screen? Because mine says First Kings 3. Yeah. You're just oh, you know what I did? I'm sorry. You're reviewing, right? You're reviewing. Yeah, you're. Yeah, you're and you know what I forgot to do? Huh? I this thing. It's okay. It's early. Yeah. 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 Let me. Um, hey, listen. It took me that long to figure it out. So. Okay. So. Yeah. Oh, so David right. dies. Right. Okay. Are. Right. Okay. So David dies, and his tomb they think might be over here. And you see this wall here. Mm -hmm. That is this wall here. So this might be David's tomb. Maybe. We don't know. Wow. And unfortunately, this is also a quarry or was a quarry. Oh. And so whatever evidence there was is, you know, just taken out. Uh, were you so, there? Did you go there actually to his tomb? No. Oh. No. These are all, as you'll see as we get into chapter three, these are all um, photos from an archaeologist who takes lots of photos. And he puts together what he calls photo companions to the Bible for oh, each book of the Bible. Okay. So this is how his thing is usually look is he has the verse up here. Yeah. And then um, down here, he has um, where it comes from and what it is. Oh. So what's unusual about this is, is uh, you notice all the Egyptian like motifs here, like the birds and the, right. the papyrus plants and whatnot. And, but this is from Megiddo, Megiddo, which is in Canaan, okay? And that shows you the, the influence that Egypt had in this area, okay? And, uh, and, and this is a Canaanite ruler on his throne. But notice this creature here. Yeah. Okay, that's a cherubim yep. or cherub. It's not those angels with the wings or those little cute things. This is a cherub. And when they talk about cherubs next, you know, on the Ark of the Covenant, this is what they're talking about. Okay. So um, now, now how does, now one of the things about these stories, you know, there's th three people oh, he, yeah. he wants, so David wants Solomon to, to destroy. One is Joab. One is, um, this guy Shammai, and he he um, wants to him to deal well with uh, Barzilla's sons. But and how does Solomon consolidate his kingdom? And that's what the rest of this chapter is. And you'll see it's extremely bloody. So Adonijah is the guy who is is the eldest of David's sons. Solomon is his third or fourth son. Fourth son. Okay, um, the first eldest was Absalom, who rebelled and was killed. The second was Adonijah, who decided that he, his, his dad was dying, so he was going to declare himself king. Okay, but while he's declaring himself king, Nathan, come, Nathan the prophet comes in and with Bathsheba convinced David to put Solomon on the throne. Mm. Okay, and Solomon is Bathsheba's son. Okay, so um, so Adonijah comes in and says, "Look, I'm really sorry. I, I overset my bounds, and you know, I'm I'm good." So <clears throat> after Solomon comes on the throne, Adonijah comes into Bathsheba and says, "You know, could you do me a favor? Can you ask Solomon for um, Abishag the Shumanite as my wife?" Wife. Now, Abishag was this attendant that they had gotten David in his old age so that um, she would be, you know, his basically his nurse. And uh, it emphasizes the fact that he did not have sex with this, this woman. OK, so but that's not clear that anybody knows that. But anyway, so Adonijah comes in and asks Solomon for Ab Abishag. OK, now. What this, what he's, one of the 
implications of this is that if he takes on a, quote, wife of the former king, he's aspiring to kingship. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Bathsheba comes to Solomon, asks for the hand here, and King Solomon says, what? Are you crazy? Why doesn't he ask me for the kingdom? Two, he's my older brother. And, you know, the, that priest of Biathar and Joab was on his side. So what he does is he sends his, his, um, his guy, Benaniah. Okay, Benaniah does all of Solomon's dirty work. And he sends Benaniah out to kill Adonijah for his presumption. So the only other uh, claimant to the throne is dead. Okay. Now, when um, he then says this, this priest, Abiathar, who supported Adonijah, you go to Anathoth way out there in your estate, stay there, and I don't want to hear from you again. Okay. Then um, this is what Anathoth looked like in the, around the, in the early 20th century. And then I was getting sick of people dying and whatnot. Oh. So, um, um, so when when Joab hears about this, Joab knows that he's next. So he goes into the um, tent of, of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. And he grabs the horns of the altar, and and they do have like little horns. I'll show you in another picture. And um, says. Uh, and says, and flees there for, for um, clemency, okay? And, um, but Benaniah is going in to kill him. He says, come out. He, Benaniah tells him to come out, but um, Joab says, no, I'm gonna die here. So when Benaniah goes back to the king, he says, yep, this is what this guy did. And, um, um, and the king tells Benaniah, look, do as he says kill him right there okay and thus it will take away from me and my father's house the guilt for the blood that Joab shed without cause and um you know Solomon assures Benaniah that uh, the Lord will bring back his bloody deeds on his own head so Benaniah goes out kills him and buries him in at his own house near the wilderness now wherever that is um Oh, and it, it also mentions that he replaces Abiathar with, with Zadok. So this is the um, this is the wilderness would be way down here. Okay. So the third guy he had the the next guy he has to take care of is Shemai. And he tells Shemai, he sets Shemai up and he tells him, he says, um, build a house in Jerusalem and don't go anywhere. Okay, whatever. For on the day you go out and cross the Wadi Kidron, for certain you will die. So In house words, arrest. Yeah. What? First house arrest. Yeah, right, basically. Mm. And so um, this is the Kidron Valley, which is the deepest of all the valleys around here. Oh. Um, and then there's all sorts of other valleys here. Um, the Hinnon Valley and all that. And so... <clears throat> That's what he does. So he lives like for three years in um, in Jerusalem. And but then two of his slaves run away. Now, slavery in this day and age has nothing to do with um, um, you know racism. Okay, if you're in a war and you capture prisoners of war, they become slaves. You know it's one of those deals okay so two of his slaves run away from jerusalem to gath which is right on the, the border here this is all um philistine area okay these are the philistine cities un underlined here in red ascalon ashdod joppa ekron and gath and each uh, it's not a whole country each city has its own king and kind of rolls the area around it. And so he goes to Gath and he, he uh, gets them. 
um, to get his slaves back and he brings them home. Okay, here, here's a guy riding on a donkey who goes out after him. So when Solomon was told that he had gone from Jerusalem to Gath and returned, uh, Solomon summons him and says, didn't I make you swear by the Lord and Sol solemnly command you saying no for certain on the day you go out and go to any place, whatever, you shall die? And you said, yep, the sentence is fair. I accept. Well, guess what? You didn't keep that oath and um, you're going to get killed. So Ben and I goes out and kills him. And the throne is established. Did we do this last week? Don't ask me. I slept through it. I was going to say, I wasn't here. I wasn't <laughs> here. So basically, uh, they're all, you know, they're, he's just uh, letting everything go to get on that throne. <laughs> he's, that's yeah, it. basically. And, and the, the, the thing about this is, is that um, this is the original charge, okay? Um, and notice that when he has Benaniah kill him, you know, he talks about the Lord will, you know, put such and so on this guy's head because he's the one that drew blood first, okay? Mm -hmm. And it, it's basically telling you how Solomon solidified his throne yeah, and how clever he was about it. Yeah, he put people, it's like playing chess game. He put people in a, uh, you know, exactly. they, were pawns. they were pawns in a chess game. It never exactly. to go over it again, too, because it's it's not the way we think mm. as civilians and as women and as, you know, having grown up in a different culture. Right. Right. And to, to see the way he is carefully consolidating things and yeah. sweeping clean. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like a mob boss. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's it's the Yakuza of Israel. Yeah, I'll, get you, being, I'll get you to do everything I want and I'll just sit back here and wait for it to all happen. There was yeah. one there's one point where you said something, Chris, and I thought, I want you to do me a favor though. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Why don't you do me a favor though? <laughs> right. Right. And it's, so I mean the whole it it's it's like David tells when david does his charge to um oh i'm sorry we're way up here um when G david gives his charge to to solomon he says act therefore according to your wisdom and do not let his gray head meaning joab go down to shoal in peace okay and the same um and the, the same thing with um uh let's see Shammai. Shammai's way down here um you know i swore to him by the lord i won't put you to death okay by the sword but i don't hold him guiltless here for you <laughs> and then it says for you are a wise man you will know what to what you ought to do to him and you must bring his gray head down with blood to sheol Okay, so notice the wisdom here is um, um, not our kind of wisdom. <laughs> it's basically the clever ways in which Solomon, the, the, you know, yeah. fulfills his father's words. It sort of gives the house of David a little bit of a different, you know, like a, almost like a bad name, right? <laughs> I'm just like, well, you know, you know, I, I, one of the things I learned in in seminary is that. The word David means thief. Ooh, okay, go. and right. and if we had read through First and Second Samuel, you, you'll you'd see that this was like, you know, this was Free David from. was <laughs> could be ruthless at times. I know. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, but when you think of Solomon, you think of wisdom, and you know, my my uh, you know Bible in school was like. Uh, the mother with the baby and the, you know. It, well, it, we'll, you we'll, know. we'll get to that one. Yeah. yeah. We'll get to that one. This is, a so this is more in depth considerably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
So this is David uh, or Solomon on his throne here. Now his throne features lions, which is a Tissot thing. But um, one of the things we've been doing is is the pictures here yeah. that I have of uh, a lot of the pictures. Like I'll show you the Absalom picture again. Like this Absalom. Oh, I'm sorry. No, not that one. This is the Absalom picture. They're all by this guy named James Tissot. And uh, what this guy did was in the late 18, 18 between 1885 and 1895, he uh, went to went to Israel mm. and started um, drawing and sketching and and what was actually there. And so in his own way, he really. Um, uh, tried to make everything look like it was back in that day. Uh -huh. And his his uh, pictures of the New Testament, oh, I, have, I discovered him because I had this book. I found this book in a library or in a bookstore in Framingham. This is volume one of his pictures of the New Testament. Wow. Okay, and it's just like, you know, they're all in here and they're just, um, he does black and white, he does color. And um, if you want the pictures for the New Testament, um, you go to um, the Brooklyn Museum of all places and you can download any of them. Oh, that's interesting. But only the New Testament ones, the Old Testament ones, you have to go to the Jewish Museum of New York. So. In this picture, did he, they hang him up by his hair? Yeah, what happened was he was riding on his donkey or something, oh. and he got his hair, which was always you know, glorious and whatnot, right. got right, right, tangled right. in the branches of, of a terebinth. And he, um, he, he was stuck. Yeah. And while he was stuck there, Joab came up and, you know, threw a stabbed him and then had a bunch of the other folks around him stab him. Okay. His hair was his crowning glory and it sort of done him in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Exactly. That. Oh, that's interesting. And exactly. I had wondered if they had tied him to the uh, tree and then massacred him. No, he, he got tangled in the tree and tangled. his hair. He forgot to duck when his horse went under. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow. But it was in the middle of a battle. So, uh, you know, yeah. all sphere yeah. and love and war. Because yeah. so, none, um, none of those arrows looked like they were deep enough to do anything, if you know what I'm saying. You say yeah. You and stab. to tell you the truth, he didn't, he didn't, um, he didn't picture what actually happened was because Joab took three sticks all together and just whammed them into him. And then he asked the men around him to shoot him oh, wow. with arrows. Wow. So, As a, uh, an extra thing okay. yeah. to make sure. Just to make sure. They, they wanted to make sure. When they wanted you dead, they wanted you they really want you dead. Right, right, Victor. Yeah. They wanted you dead. That's it. Well, they had a, these guys all had a contract on them. <laughs> yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah, there was a contract out on them. Mm -hmm. mm. So, um, so when Kathy comes back, I'm assuming she's getting coffee. Might be. Is it? Yeah. Was that Kathy? Yeah, that was Kathy. I'm sure, if that was Paula. Oh, Kathy. wait a minute. She left. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So she'll she'll get here. Um, okay. So I'm going to stop this share uh -huh. and go to the other one, which is right here okay so this is kings three and four yeah yeah when i read this i wondered why are they why is he marrying someone from outside his tribe i mean do you know what i'm saying it's like yeah yeah well um a little peace peace thing going on there um yeah as we will Where? see uh, as i uh, as i showed you in that last um you know that, um, let me see, let me go back. Let me stop this share and go back and do the other share. Well, Solomon married a lot of foreign women, didn't he? Uh, yeah, and that was his downfall. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, so, so here, remember this picture. Okay, yeah, exactly. now this picture is a Canaanite ruler, meaning this is a picture of someone who rules within, it, within Israel, okay? Yeah. 
And notice all the Egyptian influence on this yeah, picture. Yeah. I mean, the clothing here, the, the papyrus, the birds, um, the cherub looks like a, a, an Egyptian cherub. We'll, right. we'll get to see other kinds of cherubs. Right. Um, and and it was for for centuries, Egypt actually um, uh, held this area. It was under uh -huh. Egyptian rule. Uh -huh. And as you'll see, um, the Egyptians try to take it back uh, when when Solomon is ruling. Mm. Okay, but uh, you know we, we don't think of Egyptians as having any influence in this area, but they did. They had a lot of influence. Um, okay, so we're going to go back to the other one, and do, 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 do. there we are. Okay, somebody want to read that? We'll do it. Solomon made a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people were sacrificing at the high places, however, because no house had yet been built for the name of the Lord. Okay, so um, at, at this point, he... The, the, the implication here is that she lives in the city of Jerusalem until he finishes building the temple and the house and, and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Is and his house, is his house somehow related to the temple or? or um, it, well, um, his, project? his, the temples eventually on top of the hill yeah. And and his house is a little bit lower on the hill. Okay. His palace is a little bit lower on the hill. We'll, we'll get into that. Let me tell you, there's going to be chapters. Sense. It makes sense to do them together. Yeah. However, the only thing that, that exists in Jerusalem is the tent on top of the hill. Okay. There's a tent and the ark is in the tent. Okay. Um, but there's not enough room to do sacrifices, okay? Yeah. And it Jerusalem is not considered the central place yet. Okay. And um, because there's no temple. Yeah. I have a question. I know this sounds whatever, but um, why are they all fighting over Jerusalem? I mean, can he, I mean, it, he's there, they're there. Yeah, everybody seems to want a piece of Jerusalem. Uh, what makes Jerusalem uh, so important? Is it that it's in the, in the, uh, you know, the, um, it's critical for them to be established there through the Bible or? Uh, for, uh, who are the them you're talking about? I'm talking about like Solomon and the other, you know, the. Okay, well, Egyptians Solomon. And the Syrians and everybody seems to, and, you know, eventually Palestinians, everybody wants Jerusalem. Why? Okay, well, uh, back then, Jerusalem is simply the place where David chooses to put his, his city, and it's kind of in the center area of his whole kingdom, mm. okay, um, at, of the, at the time. Yeah. And um, um, let me get, go down. It's also here. elevated, isn't it? So it's strategically small. Yeah, it's somewhat elevated. Okay, so this is... Okay. This is um, this is Solomon's kingdom, okay, this whole thing here, okay? okay? And, and the way to find Jerusalem uh, is, is you go to the top of the, of the Dead Sea and go a little bit west, and you'll see that's Jerusalem, that little black dot right there, okay? Right there. Yeah. That little, okay, now. I see it, yes. Okay, so now this, this territory, the greenish territory, is all that David conquered, okay? And notice that Jerusalem is almost in the center of it. Right, right. Okay. But it's not near the water. It's not like a port city or anything. You know what I'm saying? No. You, one of the things you have to remember is that um, the Israelites were not sailors. Mm. And we'll get more into that later on. Mm. Um, uh, but they were not sailors. The Phoenicians up here were sailors. Uh, and the Phil Philistines down here were sort of sailors, but Phoenicia was known for its oh. sailing. Okay, so um, so he picks Jerusalem, 
And so that's how Jerusalem gets to be the capital of, uh, mm. of the kingdom. Okay. And um, because it's the capital, David had wanted to put the temple there, you know, mm. build a, a real house for, for God, you know, <laughs> like, um, like he had, you know, he has a, a palace. So, you know, God should have something um akin so he um he you know he asked god if he could do this and his prophet nathan says yeah go ahead and that night the prophet has a dream and the dream says uh -uh, nope this is something for his son because david's hands are full of blood because he's the one that did all the battles and conquered everybody and you know did all that kind of stuff yeah, Solomon so other people to do his job so yeah, blood. yeah, right. Solomon's <laughs> hands are also full of blood, but he was more selective. Yeah, he was yeah. like, oh, well, let somebody else do that. <laughs> yes, right, exactly. So, but he wasn't in any battles, okay? Uh, I mean, remember that David spends most of his his reign battling people, hmm. um, whether it be Saul or the Philistines or, you know, whoever. So, um, so he doesn't build a temple, hmm. okay? So people were sacrificing at high places and high places um, are like this. Okay, now in this case, um, and this again, one of, the, one of the places I got all these pictures, especially the ones that are bordered in black here, are, um, are from this guy who does this photo companion to the Bible. Okay. And um, in this case, he, he defines a high place, which is an important concept to get because you'll see this tension between the temple and high places all through Kings. And for the Deuteronom Deuteronomic historian, high places are evil. Okay. Oh. People should be sacrificing at the temple, not at high places. Okay. Now, a high place is a cultic installation which features one or more priests, cultic activity, in other words, sacrifices, and some sort of apparatus, i.e. a standing stones, an altar, asherim, which nobody is quite sure what they are. Um, and such, can, such an installation can be found in almost any place, not just on elevated ground. Okay. So. Um, so this is in a in a valley. There's a bridge that's gonna. This is what happens in Israel is that you go and you do a building project, and there's always an archaeologist on the construction team. Yeah, we expect. Yeah. And so in this case, they're going to build this bridge, and they come across <clears throat> an Iron Age temple. Now, Iron Age two means it's you know probably. 9th century BCE. Okay, and they have it features a sacrificial altar in the courtyard. And um it's now under a bridge. <laughs> so this guy took the picture um or was taken before the overpass was constructed. Okay. So um so that's definitely not a high place, it's a low place. Okay. So um Now, what there is in a high place, this is the altar. Okay, now this is, a, this is an archeological dig and everything here is, is covered up so the rain won't do bad things to it. Okay, but in the middle is this stone altar. Okay, and the entrance is up here and, um, and um, this may have been a place where the Ark of the Covenant stayed for several months. The Ark of the Covenant kind of moves around and it stays here for a few years, stays there for a few months, you know, and it's separate from the tent of meeting, as you'll as you see. Okay. Got all that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, remember I told you about the horns of the altar? Yeah. See these little projections here? Uh, That's the horns of the altar. Okay, so um, let me get my phone just a sec.
Oh, well, there's no internet. Uh, Kathy's not here because there's no internet in church. Uh, so, okay. So, so anyway, so um, somebody want to read this little paragraph here? I'll read it. Uh, Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father, David, except that he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there for that was the principal high place Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. Okay, so this is this is burning incense. These are incense altars. These are not sacrificial. regular, yeah, sacrificial altars. Okay. Yeah. And he goes to Gibeon because that's where the tent of meeting is. In other words, that's the place where uh, they've got the facilities to have you know a thousand burnt offerings, which are probably sheep. So this is Jerusalem. Here we are at the top of the Dead Sea, followed across. Oh, there's Jerusalem. Right there. And Gibeon is about two or three miles away. Yeah. Looks like it's in the mountains too. Chris. Yes, it is. Yep. But would each cult have its own altar? Because the, the altar with the horns is pretty specific to the pe the Hebrew people, isn't it? No, it's it's one of those things which was in the air. Okay, it's a generic altar. Yeah. Hi, Becky. Hey. Hi, Becky. Hi. Sorry, Kathy was having problems with the internet, and I just didn't know until just now. So now she's on a, the church computer. Oh, gosh. Oh, oh nice. <laughs> Sorry to, to stop you from talking. Oh, no, no. I, we're just getting into what Solomon's doing in high places and whatnot. Hi, Kath. Hello. At hey, last. hi, Kathy. Hey. hey, Carol. Yes. You going to say hello, hey. too? Yeah. Say hello, workers. There how do I go. do it? Okay. How do I mute it? Oh, yeah. She's, she's a... Right on. Okay. Okay, Kath. Okay. We have to get down here. Okay. Sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, so we're just talking about why... Um, Solomon goes to the high places to um, to sacrifice, and he goes to Gibeon because that's a principal high place. Okay, okay. now um, this is uh, okay when when you're talking about old cities way back when um, they they usually appear in what's called a tell, and what these are is their mounds, and what happens is that as a city is built up and buildings fall down they're kind of just buried and then more of the city is built up and more of the city is built up okay so you end up with this mound so this is the this is the the tell or the mound for gibeon okay but they don't think that the high place was actually at gibeon they think it's across the valley at this hill over here um called nebi samuel and uh, this was reportedly the place where Samuel was buried, but that's probably not right. Um, so you can see that this high place and Gibeon are fairly close, probably half a mile, a mile, something like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, oops. Okay. So this is what um, uh, this is what the hill looks like. Now, a high place, um, we're not always located on high places, um, as this thing over here says. Um, they were, but frequently they were on top of mountains and hilltops. So including, you know, the temple on Mount Zion or the altar on Mount Ebel. Ebel was the, the mountain from which Moses saw the promised land. It's on the east side of the Jordan River. Okay, and the Samaritan Temple on Mount Gezerim. Um, and we'll get, we'll say more about that. So, but people in ancient times often built things up on ziggurats, which are towers, or the Tower of Babel. Um, and this, ref this was basically because they saw um, an elevated location as closer to God. Okay, you know, we've got to reach up to God. God is in the heaven, right? So if you're on top of things, 
you're closer to God. So this is the hill. Now, to, today, you know what is remarkable about it? This is almost terracing around Yeah, it. that's what I thought, too. Hmm. Yeah. It must be mm -hmm. easier to get up that way. That well, this is the road. This is the road up it. Um, and I suspect that there might be farming happening in some of these terraces. Mm -hmm. So here's a closer pick. Yeah, in fact, you can see some of the growth in the, some of the mm -hmm. places. This is a closer pick of picture of the of the top. This here is a um, mosque. Oh. And then this is all the archaeological dig down here um, for the um, for the, the high place. This is what it looked like back in the 1890s. Uh, apparently there were they had the ability to have some kind of color photograph. And so this is one of the few fo color photographs you'll see from the 1890s. Yeah. Now, what was on top of this hill? A mosque. Oh, tent. Now, what? OK, so does somebody want to read this over here on the right? I'll do it. Although this text does not mention it here, the reason Solomon's great sacrifice took place at Gibeon was that Gibeon was then the location of the tabernacle. When it arrived there is not clear. It is possible that Saul had it moved there. Gibeon is only three miles northwest of Saul's capital at Gilbea, which would have allowed him to keep an eye on activities there. At any rate, it is clear that by the time of David, the tabernacle was certainly located there. David had appointed a group of ministers headed by Asaph to tend the ark in Jerusalem, and a group of ministers headed by Zadok to take care of the tabernacle in Gibeon. The full-sized model of the tabernacle compound in this aerial photograph was photographed at the Timna Park in southern Israel. So what some what a group did was they decided to put up a full size replica of the tent of meeting as described in Exodus. And this was their their, their model, you know, photographed from above. And so this is the tent of meeting right here, um, which has like, I don't know, three or four layers. Um, this is a a washing stand, I think. And this is the, the altar. Um, it's basically has a grate on top. So, and there's, there's coals and wood underneath. And so they sacrifice the sheep on top of the grate. Okay. And then the, as described by um, Exodus, there's this, these, this fence around it with panels and these panels are probably I don't know seven or eight feet high. Yeah. Okay, so so what's at so what's at um Gibeon is this tent and this altar. Okay, that you can sacrifice things on. The ark is in Jerusalem in another tent. And the ark is where God lives or it's symbolic of god's presence all that yeah okay so somebody want to read this i'll do it at gibeon the lord appeared to solomon in a dream by night and god said ask what i should give you and solomon said you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant my father david because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O oh Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father, David. Although I am only a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people so numerous, they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind, a listening heart, to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil, for who can govern this great people of yours? Do you okay. Want to... but yeah, let's, there's enough to unpack there's right there. Um, 
this this whole thing about the understanding mind, which is actually a listening heart, mm. um, this shows a Western prejudice. Minds are more important than hearts. And a, a listening heart is a, not about um, uh, it's not about a, a clever mind per se, but a listening heart is one that's open and one that is uh, can hear and one that listens in the sense that one really takes in what's going on. Okay, um, it's not it, you know we always think of minds, but for the Israelites, it, it, it had to do with hearts. Mm. Okay, notice in here, he walked in uprightness of heart toward you um, and whatnot. The other thing is, is this exaggeration about I am but a little child. Mm, yeah. Okay, you know, Solomon's young, but he's not a 14-year-old. You know, he's probably in his early 20s. Um, and so um, it, he's, but that idea that before God, you're this small person who can't um you know go uh you know you're not an adult you don't have the um uh, the wisdom that adults do okay got all that mm -hmm. so he's asked so what is he asking god for <clears throat> wisdom to open his heart and give him wisdom yeah basically discernment mm. and discernment between <clears throat> good and evil okay so somebody want to read that next paragraph yeah it pleased the lord that solomon had asked this god said to him because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I'd now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning heart. No one like you has been before, and no one like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare with you, if you walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life. Okay, so what's the Deuteronomy thing here? Or the, the thing that it, it keep, keep that he, the, his the Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, the Deuteronomist keeps hammering home. It's the covenantal nature. Mm. Yep. Verse 14. Mm. If you walk in my ways, keep my statutes and commandments as your father did, then I will lengthen your life. Mm. I want you to do me a favor, though. Yeah. What? I want you to do me a favor, though. <laughs> Kill so, all these people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's been rough for years. Yeah. Um, and notice this happens like three or four years into his reign because he's already killed Shammai and he had to wait three years to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so the other thing is, is you, you a great people so numerous that you cannot be counted or numbered. Okay, so this whole idea that he's a great king and no other king can compare with him and all that kind of stuff. It's somewhat of an exaggeration. Um, but the, this will give you an idea. great people what? that can't be counted is also part of the covenant. Well, yeah, okay. One of the things that that, that um, at one point David um, decides he's going to do a census, and censuses are evil mm. for whatever reason, and God strikes the land with. Uh, uh, some kind of plague because David did this. And so David has to repent in order for the, the plague to lift. Yeah. So it, 
this is almost like uh, there's so numerous I can't count them. So I'm not, you know, the implication being so I'm not going to. Oh, where did we get that from? So, but this whole great kingdom thing, and so numerous they can't be counted. Okay, this is the farthest extent of, of Solomon's kingdom. And it goes down to the to the Red Sea down here. Um, and he has a, a copper mine down here. And it goes north past Damascus, which is here, okay, right under that cross. And it goes up to the Euphrates. This is the Euphrates River. Now, on the world stage, this is not what we call a great kingdom. Okay. So this dotted line here is the extent of the Babylonian Empire. And note it goes from here that, okay, that Solomon's kingdom goes from here to about here. Okay, this whole area in here. But the Babylonian kingdom is, is much bigger. Okay, and it's Babylon that we'll find out more about this later on. The Assyrian Empire is even bigger than that. And that's this, this uh, gray line here. It goes all the way down here, even down into Egypt. And notice both those are much bigger than Solomon's. But, you know, Solomon is wealthy, and um, there's reasons for that. And he was actually a pretty clever guy. Oh. So, so, somebody want to read that? I can read it. Then Solomon awoke. It had been a dream. He came to Jerusalem where he stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. He offered up burnt offerings and offerings of well-being and provided a feast for all his servants. Okay, so he's celebrating this, this um, dream from God. Now, it's not unusual for people to go up and, you know, sleep in a high place or in a temple and then, to, you know, to ask the God of that temple to give them a, you know, a sign. And it sometimes comes in a dream. And uh, so the Ark of the Covenant, we usually see is this is and it you know it's a gold box and it's got the cherubim on top but the reason why it's got these poles and the rings is because that's how they carried it okay they had two guys on either end um and this is what we see as cherubim these angels with wings okay what solomon saw as a cherub are these things this is an egyptian cherub and this is an assyrian cherub Okay, uh, Egyptian ones, you know, have the little veil thingy and look, you know, the head of a man, the body of a lion. of a lion, the wings of an eagle, and a, there's a snake in there somewhere. Um, and uh, th these are uh, Assyrian cherubs. Notice the wings over here. And you can see, one of the reasons why I put this one is you can see how big these things are. They're huge. Okay, um, and these were these were at the gates of a city. So you have these um, um, these creatures guarding the gates of the cities. It's their spiritual um, uh, what do we call it? Spiritual guardians. It must have taken a long time for them to carve these things. You know how well they say like. Um, you know, like cathedrals and stuff take generations to make because of all the stonework and the carvings and things like that. Um, was this done before his lifetime? What? Oh, um, uh, th this stuff was was done by the Assyrians who come about 500 years after Solomon. Oh, wow. Okay. So and was, I don't, I, I that suspect. Was when he was, when he was uh, alive. Yeah, I suspect this is either sandstone or limestone, which is not the hardest thing to carve. Oh. And don't forget, that at this point, they do have iron tools. Mm. Okay. We're in the Iron Age here, folks. This thing over here is made of ivory. Yeah, that's a lot. So, so it's not, um, 
that hard to carve. Mm. Okay, so it, it's after 930. Do we want to just complete the rest of this because it's this story? Sure. Or do we want to save the, the story of the two prostitutes and the baby for next week? That sounds like a, a, yeah. a hanger. You know what I mean? You yeah. have to come back, right? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, wait a minute, they're gonna have next week, it's gonna be that. Oh wow. Yeah, and, and one of the things one of the things that starts with that story is this using of different kinds of things, uh, of different kinds of genres, and it, they're kind of just dropped in here. Like, wait a minute, that's like it in other words, from with with David's death, there was a coherent narrative that went back through Samuel. Okay, um, but starting here, it becomes more choppy. It's like they're taking pieces from here and pieces from there and putting them together. And sometimes it it reads like a a coherent narrative, and other times it's like like oh, and there's there's this story. But each one of these pieces is uh, in support of the the author or authors, the Deuteronomists, um, uh, telling of his, why, why were we exiled? Okay, so the whole, this whole thing here has been about, you know, um, Solomon's wisdom. He asks for wisdom. He's been very clever about how he gets rid of his, his enemies in this chapter. And then the last piece of, of Solomon's wisdom will. So will it's end like how he secured his throne and mm -hmm. then what he asked God for. And now that he, he dreamt about what God said back to him. That was a little confusing to me because I was thinking, is he getting these visions and stuff like that? Or Well, in a dream. By night at Gibeon. So he's probably sleeping near the tent of meeting. And um, God appears to him. So Solomon, you know, asks him. So, you know, to help him with, with an understanding, listening heart. Yeah. So. So that that listening heart thing is is really important to kind of put in your own self because we always tend to think of um you know cleverness as being in the head and certainly solomon shows that kind of cleverness but the listening heart is much more important um i used to have a friend she or she she was the daughter of the american general that um, um was in charge of auschwitz after the war and, you know, and her father would tell her stories about that. And she, her, her thing, because of that, those stories and whatnot, she says, you know, smart people are a dime a dozen. Kind people are a jewel. Yeah. And in some ways, that's what he's talking about here. Um, a listening heart, one that, you know, I can discern good and evil and um, govern wisely. Discernment. That's actually a, one of those spiritual things. Discerning stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, understanding what's good and what's evil and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. But notice that you know, it talks about the uprightness of David, but David was a real, oh, my God, some of the stuff this guy did. I mean, you know, it's like Bathsheba's husband. He has Joab kill him. Yeah. I mean, not directly. He basically sends to her battle, husband right? into battle up front where he's certain to die. Right. Manipulative. Yes. The uh, very interesting. I would keep going back in my head to the uh, woman with the baby and the and the other uh, woman, yeah. and I'm thinking that's where the listening heart comes in because he knew that he could tell how much that woman loved that baby, so he forced the situation 
to be made, uh, you know, so that he could say, okay, well, you don't care about this baby, so I'm giving the baby to her. Right. The true mother, the true mother. Yeah. But having saying how he, he was given the wisdom to put the situation in such a way that it, it allowed for the, the result, the, you know, to be, to be very visible. Mm -hmm. mm. That, that was a listening heart, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about that next week. That's very interesting. Good.